Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Thanksgiving. Most of us learn many years ago while we're in school that it's about the pilgrims who celebrated Thanksgiving at Plymouth Rock. But today we're going to be talking about the real history of what actually happened in Plymouth when 102 men, women, and children who sailed on a chartered ship for a place they had never seen are going to be discovering how we know them as pilgrims, which was a religious separatist who had abandoned their prior lives for a single cause, which was religious freedom. The others were adventurers who were motivated by real-world material objectives as opposed to spiritual ideas. Now, this clash of values created complex inner struggles for the group as they sought to establish new individual identities and a new colony. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is Native American actor of the Blackfeet tribe on the historical drama Saints and Strangers, which is coming up. We'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Kalani Cuebo. Kalani, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thank you, Daniel. It's, it's great to be on. appreciate that. And I'm impressed that you pronounced my last name correctly. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a long way from a pilgrim, but I do the best that I can do. Now, how did you get involved with this project here? How did this all come about? Well, for me, it was a traditional kind of casting process where the producers, you know, in a really traditional way, they, they reach out to casting people, and then the casting people have their connections. So I really did come about it the traditional way, and they were looking for, for someone like me in specific, and I got connected because of previous work that I've done and stuff. And, oh, it was just a joy to, to have conversations with them and find out um, that National Geographic was actually behind this and wanted to bring a, a voice of authenticity and wanted to approach it with integrity. So for me, I was just lucky enough to be in these early conversations where they were talking about producing Saints and Strangers. Now, when it came to getting the information accurately, what did they rely on to be able to draw this out? You know, National Geographic Society has a long history, and and I believe they have a lot of relationships that they've built over time. So there were countless resources that they called upon, uh, Smithsonian, and a lot of um, input from... Native communities, specifically about language, at least for the Native part. So there, you know, with such a charge that uh, National Geographic has for uh, facts, you know, they were double-checking, triple-checking, going beyond, you know, to the point where there were revisions happening daily. So they definitely relied upon the help of, of others so that they could really gather as many facts as they could and put together a piece such as this. Now, it's interesting because we could possibly glean information from, let's say, the people of the Mayflower, uh, mainly because you've got a ship's log, captain's log, whatever the case is. But when you take a look at that, that's one side versus how did we actually get the accurate information of what the natives were experiencing as all this began to unravel? Right, that's a good question. You know, that's something that comes up a lot that people want to know because seemingly there's so little that we know. Truly, you know, an American holiday like Thanksgiving, so many people have grown up celebrating this holiday and and accept it for what they think it is. And most of us don't really know what this truly is about that we're celebrating every year. If you ask anybody, they'll sort of sum it up in two sentences. So I think that uh, there were definitely, there's a biography that William Bradford had written. and you know, There's a lot, like you said, that's one-sided. That's from their point of view. So there was a lot of puzzle piecing from the facts of, you know, their viewpoints, William Bradford's viewpoint of, well, this is what happened, and then Squanto did this, and Squanto did that. And so... With the Native history, it is oral. You know, there's stories that are passed on. So, like I said, I think it's a lot of um, structuring bits and pieces and putting them together in a timeline that that was accurate. And then, of course, you have the actors who come in. And, you know, that's 
that's what the luxury is, you know, when you have a project that's so big, there's so many iconic figures that people today will proudly say, I'm a descendant of this particular person who was on the Mayflower. I am a descendant of this person. And with that comes all of their ideas and stories that they've heard all their life. You know, we were in Boston and we were in Philly, Washington, D.C., and we met people along the way who who would grab both of my arms and say, it's so nice to see a person who is real and who has feelings and who has has an agenda and who has uh, who has a breath in them so that they can relate it to the stories that they've always heard. Absolutely, and I was going to say when it comes to the traditional story that we have come to know, how different in contrast is it from what really actually happened? So I think it starts from the beginning. I think even myself, I never realized that, like the title Saints and Strangers, there were not just the separatists from the Church of England, but there were also these adventurers who were in search of riches, who were in search of a different kind of freedom, and they were all in the same boat. They were in the Mayflower, and they came over together. That was a surprise for me, and I think that there's a sense of reduction that happens in history. There's a sanitation that happens where things that we're maybe not so proud of or things that are just a little too complicated don't really get explored and presented in formal education, you know, in our early years as as a nation. So I don't think we learn a lot about really what what, what really happened when these pilgrims landed, you know. So so for me there were it, it was less about oh this was completely wrong and more about wait a minute there's so much more information there's so much more to this story than we know and what makes saints and strangers an amazing piece of of work is there is there is a huge drive with the native storyline so we really dive into the stories of not just the politics of the factions between the saints and the strangers within the pilgrim community, but the factions within the native tribes and the neighboring tribes, and also the story of Squanto, his his story of how he was captured and enslaved, not once but twice, and how he was actually, he had actually crossed the ocean four times, and learning their customs, learning their a forced nature, you know. So there's, I think for me, it's the idea of of enriching the story and, and a lot more than what, what it's been reduced to in elementary school. You know, I, I, I recall tracing my hand and, and making a turkey, art piece, you know, out of right. <laughs> out of that I think of buckles on hats and and bibles. And it's it's a very different reality. This is a story of survival and this is a story of creating home and this is a story of native people dealing with with not just the pilgrims, you know, Jamestown was happening that colony was happening in 1607. This place takes place in 1620. And long before that, there were traders and fishermen and lots of, of interaction that was hap- starting to take place. In- you know, and that's what's interesting about the whole settlement of America. When you go back and you look at the real history, it's that, for instance, the French had been on American soil for years. You know, exploring and actually being a part of the land. You know, they didn't really come and claim it as their own as the European settlers who began to come over here did. But yet we also, again, back to what we're talking about here, take a look at this Thanksgiving. Okay, so the pilgrims came here. We heard they had a rough time because they really didn't understand the lay of the land, rough winters, and so these people just simply came out, reached across, and decided to be friendly and help them out. But I think there's a lot more to that when you go to a new land where both cultures are looking at each other and saying, well, 
how do we reach across this in the first place? I don't know you. You know, there's you're you're going to be you know braced for possibilities of danger, for instance. And th- does that come through in this movie here? Absolutely, it it absolutely comes true, and I think that's where the heart of this project is. You know, in this film, like I mentioned earlier, it really is about survival, and that's the most primal, most uh, most most important thing that that we as humans have to think about, right? Before you know, if your motivation was to come over on the Mayflower for adventure and for riches, or if it was for your beliefs and your faith, then all of a sudden you're faced with survival. How do we eat? How do we create a home and shelter? How do we find safety? That puts that first and foremost, even though the motivation was to separate yourself from the, from the or to you know, make a better life for yourself in the new world, right? So I think you really see the, the dynamics of, of the native people and what that meant for them. Ultimately, Squanto, who was in, the interpreter, who was truly the bridge between the native tribes and the pilgrims, they were able to create a treaty amongst them. And they lived in harmony. There was peace between them for 50 years. I think that, that'll surprise people. And they won't realize. And there was, you know, of course, um, you know, uh, problems that happened after the 50 years. But truly... There weren't there weren't treaties just happening between the native pilgrims. There were treaties that are addressed between the neighboring tribes, and you see the conflict the conflicts that happened between. Very complicated. It's messy. It's ugly, and there are also beautiful moments. And it's all part of our history. It's all part of democratic government that we know today stems from these treaties and these agreements and these interactions that happened with the people who were already on this land, the indigenous people and the people who came to settle and colonize and two completely separate uh, ideas and beliefs come together and what happens, you know, and like I complicated and that's what makes this story so fantastic because it's something we can all relate to on the most basic level because we're Americans. There's no doubt about that. I I know that when you take on a role as an actor, there are uh, energies and dimensions that a person experiences that a person viewing the finished product doesn't get the chance to experience. You know, I mean, you really embody the character in Squanto is who you are in uh, Saints and Strangers, as, as I understand it, and uh, you said that one of the most exciting things was for you to wear Squanto's shoes. What happened there for you as you began to step in to wearing someone else's shoes? <laughs> right. You know, uh, the everything comes together, right, when you have the resources. As an actor in, the, in a project like this, and all this work is being done, and you're surrounded and supported by these amazing producers and National Geographic, who has such uh, a, a brand, right? Such uh, such an integrity in which they approach everything. You start to uh, let go of of all of the facts, and you start diving into the the colors and the feelings of of who your character is in specifics. You've got the you know, larger picture happening, but then. You get to show up with whatever knowledge that you have and whatever script that that is current at that moment, and then you get to start to fill in and 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 breathe life into this character. And you know, one of my favorite actors said that. I'm sorry, one of my favorite teachers told me that when I was um, studying acting was that that you never know who your character is until you step in their shoes. 
So understanding what connects you to the earth and and what your character is stepping into every day, right? So one of the, the huge, huge privileges of this project was we learned the Western Abenaki language, and it's an Eastern language, and it's similar to what Pocahontas would have spoken, probably close to exactly what Squanto would have spoken. Jesse Bowman Bruchak, and he was with us the entire time. He was phenomenal, and it was it was a time crunch to learn this language, and in the beginning, the director had called me and given me a conversation about the language, and he said there were a lot of discussions that were going on as to whether or not it was possible to utilize the language so heavily in the project to have subtitles and, you know, the capability of the actor. So I, I spoke for myself, and and my my contribution, you know, to look, when you have the language, it adds a richness, it adds find nuances and colors that would otherwise be lost, especially with a character like Squanto, who's speaking English and interpreting for both sides. So the language actually started to inform the way that I moved, the register in which I spoke, the the breadth of the character. It's It actually was such a challenge in the beginning because it's like asking any person to learn some obscure dialect in Russia, you know, and having never heard it before, and then being able to not just just make the sounds, but to truly understand the syntax and to be able to communicate with it in a scene while the cameras are going and having that responsibility as a native actor to live and vibrant and appropriate for whatever scene that was happening. So the language was just an incredible opportunity. To now, the language is very important. I know there was a point where you actually have a line where you actually speak that in English would have said, let's teach them how to farm here. When in fact, what it, what they really meant was, let's teach them how to work the earth. That's quite a difference, right there. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. The, the the line. So, the English version that was in the script is let us. Uh, what was it? Let's um, let's teach them how to farm here, and then it goes on further to say so that we can um, strengthen them, and then we can use them as an ally instead of treating them like an enemy. You know? So the line was, let us out of farm here. And in the Western Abenaki language, it was, Witamawa aliakika hadith. And the translation, the meaning of that language is, let us speak with them so that they may know how to work the earth. And that, that is profound. It's a different perspective. It is, it's, it's a different way of relating a thought, and it's a different way of relating to other people. Let us speak with them, talk with them, you know, as opposed to an authoritative kind of uh, approach to let us teach them because we are the authority. You know, it's, it's a different uh, perspective, and I, I think that, you know, People will see that, and I think people are a little unnerved, meaning the audiences, when they first uh, see the opening of the film and, and the Native people are referred to as savages, you know, savages, and all the fear around that and, and all of these myths that they have that they're going to arrive on this, this, this land in the New World and these savages, these savages. And, but it's truly what their perspective and their viewpoint was, and Squanto is this, wonderful character who spells their ideas of of uh, of savage and then they get to meet all these native people, Masasuit and Obamok and, and all of these people, you know, ultimately they 
they um, forge a treaty and they friends and that is such an amazing thing because there are people coming with different worldviews with Squanto because he's captured and he's in twice learns their ways and he becomes a part of their community albeit forced he's in England he's everything that 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 they do everything that they say and he comes back and he has to live with that and he chooses to use all of that to communicate and befriend them and he was very instrumental in forging relationship between the native people now how long did it take for these people to actually come together it, you know it wasn't just something that happened overnight and and is it true that in the, you know, of course, the story that we heard, that these uh, newly arrived settlers were really having a difficult time uh, where their lives really depended on it? Is that really true, or what really happened there? Well, there, yes, there was a lot of fear, a lot of unknown on both ends. So it wasn't just the Native people saying, okay, this is what's happening. There was a lot of question on the native side, for instance, and as to whether or not they were just stopping by, were they here to stay? And one of the things that they they say in the film is they brought their women and children and beasts. So that was their way of of uh, sussing out the situation, saying that means they're here to stay, right? And it wasn't there wasn't action taken on their part at first. There was a scout set, some set. There's a lot of watching. There's a lot of figuring out, and there's a lot of negotiating that's happening within the native storyline. And then with the pilgrims, it's the complete unknown. And they make moves in the very beginning where they they uh, they take things. They take um, seeds of corn from one of the stores from um outset tribe and they desecrate, you know, like a gravesite and take things. So that creates conflict in the very beginning. But yeah, it it doesn't happen right away and that's the thing that you get to see is really the colonizing the them building the pilgrims, them building their homes and deciding how many homes do we build? You know, at the rate that they're dying off, how many homes do they need to put all of their energy in and the resources that they have, you know, to be able to feed everyone and, you know, the the fresh water that they find when they first arrive. All of that played into the, 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 the most minimal um, survival story, you know, the... the I say minimal, but I, I mean like the most primal thing that they need, the basic necessity of, of survival, food, water, and, and shelter. And that's that's really, you know, it, it's, it wasn't an easy thing. And I think that in history, things are reduced, you know. If you ask people what, what is Thanksgiving, they'll say, oh, these pilgrims arrived because they wanted to find religious freedom for themselves. And then Squanto came and showed them how to plant corn and, they had Thanksgiving to celebrate, and they lived happily ever after. And that's that's simply just a homogenized, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think we all know the Native American story was way over pasteurized and homogenized. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's so, like the <laughs> idea behind the treaty, for instance. I was just watching a program on. It was the Oregon experience about the uh, segregated uh, Native American tribes that lived in Oregon, for instance, and they talked about how this U.S. treaty took these separate tribes, brought them together, put them on a reservation. They had a tough time because now they weren't in their land anymore, and they didn't know what to do, and pretty soon they started freezing and starving, you know, and then after the treaty, of course, they were just left there, and I'm thinking, but well, what is a treaty? It sounds like it was a peace accord that basically imprisoned the Native Americans while the white settlers just 
pretty much took over the land. <laughs> and I'm thinking, right. now, wait a minute, you know, what's really going on? No wonder there was a possibility of savagery. <laughs> you know, somebody comes and takes your house or whatever and says, you go live over here. It's going to be pretty rough, and it surprises me that this, especially in this story, that it actually turned out well. But that was actually the heart of the Native American culture, though. I, I think, um, yeah, you know, there's so many stories, you know, of the the desire for the land and for ownership of the land and and so many horrific stories that come out of that, you know, the experience of of our history, it's it's ugly, you know, and it's really complicated, like I mentioned earlier. And I think there are a lot of embarrassments that that have happened in our past, you know. So as a result of that, I think that cinema, uh, you know, just within Native uh, storylines or Hollywood films and television shows have depicted, you know, this this sort of idea of who Native people are, you know, just completely inaccurate and just totally uh, imagined ideas. You know, if I remember correctly, James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote the Leatherstocking Tales, you know, Last of the Mohicans and stuff, had never met a native person before he'd written a lot of that um a lot of his work <laughs> and you know wow. while I was in d c we were on you know doing a little tour where we were in Boston then we went to d c now we're here in New York City when we were in d c i I went and visited the American History Museum and I found this lovely little gem. It was just one of these little interactive things. Obviously, um, uh, uh, well, I guess it doesn't matter who it was aimed for, but it was unrelated, and yet it was completely related. It was a little bit about pirates, and it said the myths about pirates. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so uh, relatable. It said that pirates, the whole arg and matey and all of that stuff is if you say that to anybody they'll say oh pirate and if somebody you know imagines a pirate that's one of the first things that they say and that was that was not the way that pirates spoke but because of a 1950s film uh treasure island i believe that was that became part of pop culture that became a way of identifying who a pirate was, and that was a language, was art. And I thought that is completely what happened with the Native American experience. In in film and in cinema, it's accepted as truth. You know, people form their beliefs and ideas on on a whole group of peoples, like Native people, and think that oh, these things that were made up, like the howling and, and whatnot with, um, oh, that's my alarm, um, with the howling and, you know, these, these sounds, the way that they dress and this stoic approach, that's accepted as truth. And because of, that, because of this, people think, oh, aren't all Native people like that? You know, oh, but, yeah, I've seen it in this film. Or even subconsciously, they just think they know it and they have accepted it as truth. And that's the wonderful thing about Saints and Strangers is that we're giving them multi-dimensional um, characters who are, you know, when I, and I'm speaking about the native characters, they're rich, they have fears, they have agendas, and they're not just a device in order to push the story forward for the pilgrims. They are a driving force within the story, and it is just a wonderful retelling of this specific event that happens to lead into Thanksgiving, and it's so timely, you know, the idea of immigration the idea of ownership and the idea of entitlement and the idea of creating home. How do you create a new home? How do you how do you safe keep yourself? How do you live a full life and coexist? And and this is just I, I'm really excited about this project and and you know I 
you know, I've gotten to sit with a lot of audiences and watch the film and to see that people are along for the ride and they get the humor uh, that, that happens even though there is subtitles happening and all this language that that is is not easily understood by most people and to see that they're along for the ride it's just incredible so i can't wait for everybody to tune in it's going to be um on national geographic channel november 22nd and 23rd it's a two-night movie event and um i hope that this is going to spark a lot of dialogue this is going to get people to say wait a minute did this really happen i'm excited for the youth to say I want to know more. I want to learn more. And they get on search engines or they ask questions and they challenge their history teachers to see what they know and see what they can teach them. Well, no doubt Saints and Strangers will certainly help people to accomplish some of that. And is there a website people can discover more about this? Absolutely. Saints and Strangers, it's spelled out, saintsandstrangers.com. And it is, it's one of the most amazing interactive sites that I've ever seen. Um, and it will ultimately connect you to National Geographic as well. But at saintsandstrangers.com, you can learn a lot. There's a who's who. There are tons of behind-the-scenes video clips. They can hear about the language. That one in specific is just amazing. The, the, the response has been tremendous. And um, all these be behind-the-scenes, and you can find out the timelines. There's even an interactive game. And lots of information there, lots of pictures. It's connected to Twitter, hashtag Saints and Strangers. So there's a lot to learn, and it's just opening up dialogues, and it's opening up and sparking, you know, uh, um, imaginations and, and, and gaining interest from so many different types of people from all walks of life. Well, very good. Well, Kalani, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us here on the program today. It will be a very exciting experience to see what they've been able to produce on film from a relatively true historical perspective. And thank you for sharing that with us today. Absolutely. Daniel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time out. I've really enjoyed this conversation. You bet. Take care, and happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Take we want care. To thank to you. Bye-bye. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also discover more. Visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter, and also follow us on Twitter at beyond50radio as well as Facebook. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>